Good morning, everybody, and welcome to this edition of our weekly think tank for Monday, 7th of June. My name is Carl Kapalinga, and I'm the market analyst over here at Think Markets Australia. It is a pleasure to be with you as we fasten our seatbelts, get ready for takeoff, because we're going to go all over the financial markets world, checking out what happened last week and then having a look at what might happen this week. We'll do that after we talk about the Think Markets difference, which is substantial, eight dollar flat rate trades for your ASX shares, your own holder identification number, unlimited phone support, and no hidden platform or subscription fees. Four fantastic reasons to make sure your next ASX share trade is with Think Markets. And if you are new to the Think Markets family, sign up, get trading by June 30. Your first five trades are on us. There are some T's and C's, so head to the website for further details. The agenda for today is to check out everything, basically. We'll look at crypto, we'll look at shares, we'll look at indices, we'll look at bonds. We'll also check out the key macroeconomic data from last week, see where the value is in the Australian market and what the charts are saying also, and then look to the calendar for the week ahead. A very quick update on the crypto market, because it was pretty quiet over the last week. Fairly strong at the start of the week, a little bit weaker towards the end of it. And net net, we're pretty much stuck in the middle, or at least it's certainly the case on Bitcoin, which is still the uh, the biggest and most influential of the cryptocurrencies. And you can see us really compressing within a range here. So as many words I might like to put to it, the picture tells a thousand words. This is what we would call an equilibrium market where demand and supply are roughly equal and prices therefore tend to go sideways. Now this little equilibrium market is occurring within a broader downtrend where when we have falls they tend to be larger than the rallies unfortunately and when we break through key areas of support when we rally back up we don't really get back above them and that's why I've labelled here uh, the, the broader current situation over the last say two months is more of a supply side market where supply is greater than demand. That has occurred just after a more broad equilibrium market with demand and supply became more equal and therefore prices flattened out after what we called this demand side market where the rallies were much bigger than the pullbacks and when we pulled back we came back and held above in this case well above uh, previous areas of support. So a little bit of a crash course there on what to look out for on the charts of the the stocks, the, the cryptos, whatever it is that you're looking at. The bottom line is, when you're in the equilibrium phase, it's probably a good time to not be in the market. You know, it's where the market can't decide, so why would you be making a big decision with your money one way or the other? Following on from that, the time to start to get interested again would be if we can break back above that mini equilibrium zone. More specifically here, I think if we can get back above 42,000 with some higher peaks and higher troughs, uh, we are then starting to move back more back into a demand side market where demand is greater than supply. Uh, however, if we break through the bottom of this range, I'd be very cautious about breaking through 33,000. And then I'd be really, really concerned if we broke through, say, 29,000, that we would be continuing this uh, larger supply side market and we could then come down and test 20,000. If you've got Bitcoin, I guess these are some of the dynamics you have to be aware of. If you don't have Bitcoin at the moment and you're thinking about where you might want to get involved, you don't have to do anything right now. Just watch for those uh, key levels back up to the upside. The rest of the crypto market, Bitcoin's the biggest. It's got a market capitalization of nearly 700 billion. Uh, the next biggest is Ethereum. We'll talk about that on the next slide, but that's, a, that's about half that. And then they fall away significantly from there. So this is the rest of the crypto market excluding Bitcoin. And we can see that where Bitcoin, and I'm just gonna go back a slide because it's very interesting. We can see where Bitcoin has fallen beneath its long-term uptrend zone, and it's really being resisted in its sort of upward progress underneath that zone. The rest of the cryptocurrency market is still holding above its long-term uptrend zone. So that's a more bullish sign. We are seeing some higher troughs coming in, that's nice. And the peaks are kind of occurring around about the same place maybe even a little higher, that's also a pretty good sign. Hasn't been a great couple of days recently, but more broadly speaking, the trend in the rest of the crypto market is still constructive for further gains. The biggest player is Ethereum. It's about half the size of Bitcoin, about 350 odd billion at the moment. Wasn't a great week because we formed a lower peak here, 29.11 versus 3008. We're still in this phase of higher troughs and it really does speak to this sort of a compression of the market of people who are enthusiastic wishing it would go up, people who are less enthusiastic 
you know, liquidating positions, we are stuck probably in this little equilibrium phase until we can break back, I believe, above that 3,000 level convincingly, and that would put us back into this sort of demand side market again, and I'd be more than happy to put my own money on an Ethereum investment. Unfortunately, if we do break below probably that um, 21, and really if we, we end up uh, with less than a two handle again, uh, we may be heading back down to lower levels. Um, if I had Ethereum, I think there's enough in it there to hang on to it for the time being. If I didn't have it, look, I'm very much happy to sit on the sidelines until we see uh, potentially that move back above 3000. Moving along to the next of the key majors, we're looking at Cardano now. And if you sort of take out the stable coins and sort of the more sort of platform based coins, I won't mention what they, were, what they are, but if you take that out, really, it goes Bitcoin, Ethereum and Cardano is probably the next major. This one, it looks constructive, much like Ethereum, we're holding above our long-term uptrend zone. But unlike Ethereum, look, we're, we're well, well above it. I think that's really constructive. The short-term trend is still up. We're getting a bit of green in there. We've got higher peaks and troughs at the moment, so that's all, all very good as well. Look, what it boils down to is if I had Cardano, I'm definitely going to remain a holder. If I didn't have it, there's a little bit of caution out there in that we are compressing a little bit into this equilibrium market. There's a little bit of uncertainty and maybe you might be better off waiting for um, a print of sort of 190 and higher before you really got involved. If you're a bit more aggressive, you really believe the story, then there is some argument for you know continuing to buy pullbacks around that 160 zone moving along to dogecoin as crazy as it is as an, as an analyst i have to cover it as one of the majors because it's probably the next biggest after cardano whether you believe in this, the the rhetoric or not from um, its major proponent elon musk is it going to the moon look it's looking better than some of the others we've talked about today isn't it because we did see a break above um, this little uh, resistance point here at 38.78. A fairly modest pullback thus far back into that range. It's not uncommon for that to happen and we've still got you know sort of higher peaks and higher troughs. So for that reason you know happy to say that if you had it you would you definitely have reason to hold on to it. Uh, if you didn't have it look it's not my preference in the space be because I, I'm not so sure about its long-term viability but Putting that out of my mind and just focusing on the technicals, then th yeah, there, there may be an argument that uh, around 40 is, quote unquote, a potential uh, opportunity to, to enter on a pullback. Having a look at one of the key movers during the week, so this one's about uh, sort of 11 or 12, depending on which day of the week. Um, so it's not in the top 10, but it has done really well compared to some of the other ones we've seen. So, you know, a nice clear break above that little mini peak in here at 37.93. Uh, we've got rising troughs at the moment, obviously rising peaks, and the candles are still looking pretty constructive for further gains here. Let's you know call this a, a bit of an aberration, this whole um, flash crash that we had. Uh, if we took that out of it, the, the, the price action and the candles are looking pretty good. So uh, I should mention that this one is called Solana. I probably should have mentioned that at the start, but it looks very, very interesting. If I had it, I would certainly hang on to it. If I didn't have it, I think you need to pay this quite a bit of attention going forward. Okay, let's bring it back to equities now. I can see I'm way behind on time, so I will we'll have to speed up. But uh, quite a constructive week for Australian equities, certainly 1.61% to the good for the benchmark ASX 200. The best performers, no doubt, energy up 8.5%, utilities up 5.8%, staples and property also had pretty good weeks as well. Contrasting that gold down 3.5%, as we'll see in a second when we look at the gold price, it did have a a, a, a pullback this week and that hurt gold shares. The technology sector is still in the doldrums somewhat. It's been a key underperformer you can see over the last month and the question mark is whether it can return to uh, some of the solid performance we saw before bond yields really spiked up back in February and March. Uh, other than that, you know, fairly uh, broadly positive performance for Aussie shares and we can see that broad strong performance is driving us now to new highs and we have to cross out that Feb 20, 2020 as being the all time high of 71.97 because we have printed very close to 7300 uh, this week or last week I should say. This week hopefully we can actually do just that and print above 7300 and keep this rally going. No doubt the higher it goes and the further away it gets from our short term uptrend zone we become slightly more prone to a pullback. But those pullbacks will come at higher and higher levels. I can't see anything in the charts that wouldn't suggest 
that we can't continue to go higher. The candles, the price action, these high peaks and high troughs, they're all looking really, really constructive for continued gains on the Aussie market. If we do get a pullback scenario, it may be to that sort of old all-time high around that 7200 level, and we could see it go as deep as, say, 7170, and maybe in the worst case, there's a little number down here. It was uh, 7117 off the top of my head. Um, if we got below that, and only if we got below that, would I start to become concerned about the strength of the uptrend. Until then, stay the course. Having a look around the region, Asian markets were weaker last week, which is really interesting because we had such a good week and we're definitely the pick of the bunch in terms of uh, global markets at the moment. US markets, a recently strong performance there, good to see volatility coming down and European markets all modestly higher, but it does, looking at all of those highlight how well the Australian performance was. We can see US shares took a turn for the better on Friday. That was on the back of weaker than expected payroll numbers. We'll talk about those in a second. But just looking at the technical perspective here, a break of 42.38 would put us back on again. And you know, overall, the uh, technical picture very constructive for further gains in the benchmark S&P 500. The Nasdaq also took a decent turn to the to the good on Friday. It is more in this equilibrium phase compared to the benchmark S&P 500. Uh, if we break above the four, sort of 14.2 level, I think we are in the midst of a substantial move um, similar to what we have seen in the past out of these sorts of uh, consolidation zones. Uh, still too early though to uh, call that one, so we will watch it. Having a look at base metals during the week, they were down, which caused the uh, the local material sector to be a bit subdued towards the end of the week. Uh, iron ore in China did uh, pop up, however, a slightly more subdued result in the US dollar contract out of Singapore. Other than that, as we can see, gold had a bit of a pullback. Having a look at the copper chart and uh, the Markets uh, often refer to this as Dr. Copper because it's a really key indicator of global economic growth. Not always good to see lower peaks and now lower troughs coming in because this did take out 98.68, but uh, not enough, I think, to get too panicked because as long as we hold above 96.14, I still think we are within this you know broader uptrend here, and, and that indicates you know stronger global growth ahead. But on watch uh, today as a result of the move below 98.68. Uh, nickel, uh, another one of those key industrial metals, still looking relatively strong with a clear-cut short-term uptrend, long-term uptrend, and you know if we can break above uh, 18.142, we could head back up towards that 20 zone. A lot of talk about uh, nickel and the strength in nickel more recently uh, as this more broader conversation around electric uh, vehicles and uh, electric vehicle batteries. Having a look at iron ore, that we're seeing the charts reflect some of that uh, rally we discussed earlier. Moving now to gold, we uh, can see that Thursday we saw a sharp fall in the gold price, but with a pretty decent rally on Friday off this um, level, despite the fact that the non-farm payroll number really didn't go gold's way. I think that's um, fairly supportive that this short-term uptrend at least can be maintained within what is an improving long-term uptrend. But I've said it before, look, whilst I think gold looks good in the short term, I'm, it, I'm not that enamoured with it in the long term because you know, there's still some key levels we need to get through and you know, the, the, the vertical ascent of this last trend is somewhat unimpressive. But hey, you know, if you're a holder and a believer in gold, it, it, there, there is some, some constructive moves there. Uh, some very constructive moves in the energy sector, very strong during the week. Uh, the Australian dollar was also stronger, even though the US dollar index was higher. And I guess that speaks to potentially some demand out there for Australian equities uh, coming through into the currency. Bond yields fell sharply, mainly on Friday as those non-farm payrolls came out weaker than expected. This has not yet been reflected in the Australian bond market, which we'll probably see a dip today to reflect the move in, U in the US on Friday. But what we're looking at here is, uh, I guess, the, this continuation of being at the bottom of the range, recent range, I should say, on bond yields, which is supportive of equities. So as long as we're kind of around here, this is all good for equities. That's also probably some of the reason why we're making new highs. We don't want to see a big plunge down here because that would indicate that something is very, very wrong with the global economy. Uh, and as uh, you know, the Australian economy is a, is a key beneficiary of global economic growth, that would be bad for us. We certainly don't want to see it blast up here because that would mean that something's very wrong on the inflation side of things. So whilst we're in that 
you know, the bottom end of that range, I think that's all good. US bond yields take, taking a sharp move lower on Friday on those payrolls, which we'll talk about in a second. But hey, similar comments here, we're towards or moving towards the bottom end of that range, and that should be supportive for US stocks going forward. Uh, this is a little bit of fun we have on Monday mornings, just comparing this crisis versus the last crisis. Good news is we're starting to break away from this unerring, you know, a correlation that we've had previously and the breakaways to the upside. So that's pretty impressive that we are not following the GFC script from the you know, major market low. Just a bit of fun. We'll keep an eye on that one going forward. Having a look at the macroeconomic data from the week, we're a little bit behind on time, so I'm going to whisk through these. We saw that the Australian economy has returned to growth. We're up 1.1% year on year. Uh, the quarterly number was 1.8%, beating the 1.6% expected. But this is the most interesting stat. The Australian economy is now bigger today than it was pre-COVID. And correct me if I'm wrong, I think we're the only a developed country that can say that. So that's very, very impressive. And again, it's the stock market is a reflection of a country's global economic activity. So it's therefore potentially not surprising that we saw the Australian market make a new all-time high when it was confirmed in the same week that the economy is bigger now than pre-COVID. So the share market's now bigger than it was pre-COVID. Kind of makes sense. The Reserve Bank uh, had their interest rate decision today. No surprises there. They kept rates on hold, but they did mention a little bit of concern about rising property prices. It's the first time they've made a point of mentioning that, so something to watch going forward, perhaps. Having a look at some of the data out of China, it wasn't fantastic, you know, sort of roughly in line with expectations. Maybe manufacturing was a little bit behind, but any number above 50 still indicates growth in that sector. And we're still above 50 there. So we'll, we'll take that one as being a mild positive, as we will with the, the private sector case in uh, PMI, which came in at 55.1, which to be fair, was better than the 52 expected, but was a little bit down on the previous reading. So mixed result on the Chinese economy, but still showing some modest growth there. Showing far more than modest growth was the US versions of those surveys. The services PMI came in at 64 ahead of expectations of 63 and up from the previous month. And the manufacturing PMI came in ahead again of expectations at 61.2 and better than the previous month's expectations. And we're way, way into the growth phase here when we've got readings above 60. So that's really impressive for the US economy going forward. Prices paid, so looking at whether you know there's sort of inflation on the input side that might get passed to consumers, it actually took a little bit of a dip for the month. So that's probably um, helped calm the market's nerves a little bit last week as well. But if you read into these surveys, look at the comments within the surveys, there was lots of talk about supply backlogs, difficulties in getting skilled labour or labour that's fit for purpose, and um, rising cost pressures as well. So we're still definitely on notice and on watch on some of that industry-related data. Having a look at the non-fund payrolls, we saw a big reaction in bonds and stocks on Friday. Bonds rallied, stocks rallied, yields came down because this number here at 559 was quite a bit below the expectations of 650, 675, if, depending on which survey you looked at. And there were some whisper numbers that were expecting as many as 800,000 jobs to be created in May. Now, the good news is at 559, it's roughly double what we were seeing pre-COVID. So there's still plenty of jobs being created. If you said pre-COVID that half a million jobs were created in the US economy in a single month, you would say that the economy is going absolutely gangbusters. So in one sense, that's a very um, good print. In another sense, look, it missed expectations. We also saw the participation rate fall. That's not necessarily a great sign either. So markets have taken this basically as a sign as it is weaker than expected. Therefore, it will be longer until the Federal Reserve achieves one of its key objectives, and that is a return to full employment, and therefore interest rates can stay lower for longer, and that should facilitate higher stock prices, long story short. Okay, having a look at the value in the Australian market, or is there value? Typically, uh, historically, uh, a P around about 15 was considered 
fairly average for the Australian market. It's about fair value. Once we sort of get up towards the 20 zone, we're starting to become expensive. And once we get down into the tens, that's typically where uh, the major bottoms uh, of, of markets have occurred, where we're looking pretty cheap. We're still more probably on the expensive side of the ledger, but that trend has been um, down over the last few months. We were close to 20 not that long ago. And I think the other important thing is we're still cheaper than the rest of those um, you know, key economies from around the world. So constructive, I think, for higher prices, but not necessarily a huge runaway in prices given that you know we're still probably towards the expensive side of the ledger. That doesn't mean there aren't really cheap sectors out there at the moment. I think the material sector is looking really cheap with a P of 11.3, that's definitely towards that cheap zone. Energy, historically, I think, still looking fairly well valued and uh, certainly cheaper than the rest of the market. And financials aren't too bad either. They do fall away from there with information technology being the most expensive of the sectors. And we discussed earlier that you know it is struggling as well from a, from a sort of a price standpoint, a trend standpoint. And I think that's part of the key issue there is that valuations are still very high. If we do see uh, those uh, bond yields come down significantly, it will facilitate, I believe, quite a big rally in tech shares. And that might then um, spark in memory about that chart we looked at on the NASDAQ earlier on also. But hey, that's uh, future looking. So let's get back to what's happening right now. Short term trends and long term trends on Aussie sectors. The uh, stalwarts of this rally are still the discretionary financials and materials sector. More recently, sectors like healthcare have joined the party. Uh, staples and property are improving as well. Uh, you can see there, uh, staples last week was uh, might have even been neutral neutral. Now we've gone to up on the short term trend. That's an, an improvement. And telecommunications, uh, also one of the key improvers over the last few weeks. I'd still be really cautious about our information technology shares and our utility shares because I haven't seen enough are done on the charts to suggest there's enough money coming back into those sectors to warrant wading in in any big way. Gold took a hit last week. I think that was up, up last week, back to neutral, neutral this week. But we looked at the gold chart and we see it's um, short-term uptrend, long-term uncertainty. I'm not that excited about the sector anyway. Uh, watch this week, watch energy. Keep, keep an eye on energy. Had a big rally last week. Some, uh, and when you have those big rallies uh, on some volume, mind you, it's generally the start of something bigger again. So watch out for some of those energy plays. I'll tip you towards uh, you some uranium stocks that look very interesting at the moment on the charts. And I'll do a think technical later in the week and cover these more specifically. Um, but out of our resources, ticker code ADA, Bannerman, BMN, uh, Paladin, PDN and Deep Yellow DYL all look interesting in that space amongst uh, the usual Woodside, Santos's, Oil Searchers, Wally Parsons and Karun Cass, uh, my picks in that sector. Okay, market breadth. So what we're looking at here is the performance within the ASX 300 stocks compared to their moving averages. Okay, these are exponential moving averages. These are the periods down here. There are five trading periods in one week. Okay, you need to take out weekends, of course. Uh, therefore, 10 periods is two weeks. This is one month. That would be two months. Uh, three months and so on. Uh, we get sort of six months out here and then we go out to a year. So where is the current price of each stock in the A6300 relative to its band of moving averages? A healthy market is up around that sort of two thirds mark. Okay, if we can get and, and flat through the curve. This is a very healthy market. It shows that you know two thirds of stocks are participating in the rally. Investors are broadening their search uh, out throughout the market. It's not just concentrated in just a few stocks that are driving all of those index points. When the market is broad, with more stocks participating, we're more likely to go higher. When the market is the opposite of that, which we say is very narrow, it's being driven by just a few of those key, uh, heavily weighted blue chips. It's more prone that if those stocks happen to turn around, that then everything uh, turns around. So it's a really good sign at the moment. We're basically at record best levels here and certainly well away from where we were at the midst of the COVID crisis. So this is just an indication here of um, how it looks when it is terrible, and it also highlights how good it is right now. So constructive for higher share, share prices going forward on the Australian market. Having a look to the week ahead, we do have some ANZ job ads out this morning at 11.30, not far away. Then the NAB Business Confidence and the Westpac Consumer Sentiment Surveys, those typically come out in the same week. And then the Melbourne Institute Inflation Expectations index coming up later in the week.
Having a look abroad, we do have some big data out this week, and I'll point them out for you. At 11.30 on Wednesday, watch for market reactions here to the Chinese inflation data. The CPI, Consumer Price Index, and PPI, Producer Price Index, uh, we are expecting 1.6% on the CPI and, to be fair, a whopping 8.5% print on the PPI. They are both significantly higher than their previous readings, and that is speaking to some of the inflation that's feeding into global uh, economies at the moment. The last time we saw this data and this data here, the US equivalents, uh, or at least for the CPI, coming out on Thursday evening our time, uh, they sent markets lower. Okay, So be careful on these on those two days. Having said that, uh, a couple of weeks ago we had the PCE index, which is the Federal Reserve's preferred measure of inflation. We talked about this in our last uh, weekly think tank, actually. And we said that that was a pretty awful number as well. It was very high, like these. But the market went up on the day. And I said that that was starting to tell us that markets are digesting this inflation bogeyman, that we're get, sort of getting calmer and used to it, and that stock prices could still thrive in an environment where temporarily there were higher prices. If we see markets go up on Wednesday and Thursday in response to really bad numbers, I think that confirms for us that this inflation issue is somewhat becoming less of an issue, uh, less of a major issue, at least for markets. So we have got a very, very interesting week coming up and then almost paling in significance, the University of Michigan Consumer Sentiment Survey uh, on Friday evening, our time. Well, that's it for me today. Thanks for joining me. If you want to catch up with all of our market news updates, head to that section of the website right there. I publish a lot of updates on uh, my Twitter feed. You can follow me, all the Think Markets handles over there as well. Tomorrow, very interesting, we've got the Ask the Expert session. Head to the webinars section of the website to register for that. You must register and then you get to join me at uh, 12 p.m. Sydney time and ask me anything about your portfolio. So this is where you get to bring your portfolio to, to the table. I'll give you a quick fundamental and technical on any stock or any crypto or any index, whatever you like. Uh, and it is a very, very productive session. So definitely register and tune in for that one. Otherwise, register for some of the other events we have. Thanks for sticking with me today. I can see it's been quite a long session, but we did have a fair bit of ground to cover. The disclaimer before I leave you says that everything we've discussed is general in nature. We are a regulated Australian broker. We do have some products that could see you lose more than your deposits, and that's very important you understand that as well. Read the disclaimer. Ask us questions if you have any problems at all. Until then, it has been a pleasure chatting with you. All the best for your trading until we catch up again. Bye-bye for now.